in North Carolina, although I live in New, in New Orleans. And this novel is set in the 60s in North Carolina. Uh, it's my contribution to the literature of dangerous childhoods. Uh, it's about a little girl, uh, Claire, she's a narrator. She's 11 at the time of the story. And um, her mother's always been very erratic, and her mother's also a very good artist. She's a good pianist, but she's a very erratic mother, and they live in a very small town in eastern North Carolina. And her mother comes home with their second baby, and it's clear that the mother's very ambivalent about this child. And immediately the family has to start to come up with other people to fill the maternal role. The mother is just not going to do it. <laughs> so the novel is about uh, the increasing difficulty that, that Claire feels and the danger Claire feels. She even begins to feel danger for the safety of her baby sister. And um, it reaches a climax that's a pretty much very critical event in Claire's life and uh, her life is never really the same after. And that's the arc of the novel. So I'm going to read you just two short passages. I hope I can see them. Okay, so, um, the first one is set um, a few days after the baby's home. The baby's only less than a month old, which it says here. One night, when Sweetie wasn't even a month old yet, I heard her crying in their bedroom. That was n normal, the 4 a.m. bottle, but she was very loud. I'm sorry, I'm one hand. <laughs> Her voice was so high and light that I didn't recognize it at first. My mother was saying, my father was saying, what is that? Why is she there? Who put her there? That's what her, my father said. If my mother answered, I couldn't hear her. I heard loud footsteps and then little squeaks. I came out of my bedroom and saw my father rolling Sweetie's bassinet toward me on its wobbly wooden <laughs> casters, which were no bigger than spools. At my door, he took a sharp turn and pushed her into the nursery, a small room next to mine, where we already had the crib set up. I had been told she wouldn't be ready to sleep in there for a month or more. I followed him in, asking questions. He refused to answer. He picked her up and went over to the crib. I told him the bed wasn't made. No sh sheet. Okay, he said quickly. Okay, okay. He put her back down in the bassinet then stood over her for a while, staring down as if she had something to tell him, and he was waiting to hear it. I joined him, wondering at our baby. She wasn't crying. She was silent. Why she was so quiet was the mystery. Her legs pedaled in the air under a thin yellow nightgown. She kicked her booties off. I put them back. After gazing at her a while, my father shook his head and said to me, go back to bed. She's a fine. Will you see the bottle? He found it among the blankets of the bassinet and stood it on the, right, on the night table. You know what to do? Then after a few minutes, he put the cover over her, gave her the pacifier, put her on her stomach, and rubbed her tiny back with his thick fingers. When he was certain she was asleep, he left. Later from down the hall, I heard my mother's voice very high. I still couldn't tell what she was saying. But my father asked, what is the matter with you? That's in the first chapter. Um, things get a little more difficult as time goes on. And this is uh, when Sweetie's 16 months old. Um, and uh, the family situation has accelerated. About a week after my parents fight over the piano, I woke to the sound of Sweetie crying. It seemed far away, almost in another world, but that was possible in that house, with its seven bedrooms, first parlor, library, butler's pantry, two staircases, sleeping porch, and a second parlor, which was now locked. I went into the nursery, but Sweetie wasn't in her crib. As I got closer to my parents' bedroom, down on the other end of the hall, I heard water running. Mother must be taking a bath, I thought, so Sweetie got into something, but where was she? I was breaking a rule going into my parents' room uninvited. It had a big sky blue bedspread and heavy curtains. There was a peacock colored chaise lounge with little fleur de lis in the pattern. My mother spent much of her time there with cigarettes and the air conditioner. The bed was unmade, but no one was in it. 
For her to be up on a Saturday before nine was a surprise. Sydney, the housekeeper, came in late on Saturdays in a taxi cab after she'd done the grocery shopping. Then there was silence. I even thought I had dreamed Sweetie's crying for a moment. But I heard her again, a different sound, like a goose honking. I wondered if she was in the hall, caught up on something. I was afraid of the bath because my mother was, would shout at me for sneaking up on her in there. And she must have been in there, for the water was pounding away. Sweetie screamed again, so I had to venture in. First was the dressing area with two sinks and a wide mirror. The tub was in a room beyond that. I turned toward it. Sure, I would see my mother's naked body, which was smooth and wonderful, under bubbles. I had seen it before, how perfectly white and round she was with her high mounds of breasts, the small domes through the water. But there I found Sweetie in her bath by herself, on her back, naked and red as a kidney bean. She was flapping her arms, her little mouth <clears throat> opening and closing. The water was up to her ears and rising. At first I thought, I can't be seeing this. This is impossible. Somehow then I managed to grab her up by the arms. I almost dropped her on the tile floor. She was so heavy and slippery. Once I got her head over my shoulder, I could get a better hold on her, and she stayed there and stayed put for a while. I got a towel across her. Sweetie was a thick, heavy baby I loved to be close to. Even squirming across my body like that, with her mouth wide open screaming and her chest heaving, there was something wonderful about holding her. Everybody was supposed to want a lusty baby like Sweetie. Struggling down the hall with her, I saw my mother below, standing on the first landing, looking out the stained glass window. She was wearing her quilted robe with, the bule, with blue mules. She had a cup of coffee in her hand. I knew that this act, the one she had just con committed, of leaving a 16-month-old alone in a high tub with the water running was terribly wrong and was no accident. But how could that be? I corrected myself. How could she leave Sweetie in the bath? Sweetie must have got there some other way, although I knew no other way. There was no one in the house. My father had gone away to Raleigh overnight. It was a big, deep tub with feet and walls too high for her to climb in or out. My mother must have heard us coming, Sweetie honking in my arms, but she did not turn around to see us. When I got down to the landing, I saw her eyes were veiled, even though they were open, and she finally said, as if surprised, What? Oh, you have that thing. She never stops complaining. Then she paused and I thought, I saw a flash of something new, something terrifying, a glance like frost. A single eyebrow rose up. She said, good of you, so good of you. You're such a wonderful girl, Claire. Then she looked out the window again. <laughs>